Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're going to be putting a capstone episode on the Women in Engineering series. We just had two wonderful weeks of powerful women telling their stories, and we kind of wanted to bring it together to a what now? You know, what do we do after hearing all these great stories uh, out there? And to help us walk through the what now, the next steps, we're, we have with us today Christine LaFave Grace. She is a writer and an editor. And we're very excited to have her and her expertise. So, Christine, how are you doing today? I'm great, thanks, Chris. How are you? I'm great. It's I'm excited. I, I was the Women in Engineering series has been just such a personal one for me. You know, I have two daughters, and uh, one just actually just turned ten years old, and uh, they they had their, wow. their their futures in front of them. And so, you know, maybe just start off our listeners just by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're so passionate about, about this topic. Absolutely. Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm a writer and editor. My background is in journalism. Um, for about the past 15 years, I've had the chance to cover a few different industries, um, including manufacturing and healthcare technology, which are uh, really interestingly related, actually, but um, covering those for trade magazines in particular. Back in late 2017, I was serving as managing editor at Plant Services Magazine outside Chicago. Um, Plant Services and its sister magazines cover really all different facets and sectors of the manufacturing world. One of my colleagues, Erin Hallstrom, she'd had the chance to work previously on this program recognizing women who were leading the way in the food processing industry. And all of us editors, you know, at the company, we'd come across these great stories of women in these traditionally male-dominated manufacturing sectors who were leading their organizations on technology change and evolving, you know, the organizations to really be poised for success in this new manufacturing and industrial production environment. But there was kind of no one space to collect these stories together and give women the opportunity on the pages of our magazines and our website, certainly, to amplify their stories, you know, and talk not only about their work, but also what it has meant to them to be sometimes the only in the room, you know, the only woman or the only woman of color, for example. So my colleague Erin said, you know, hey, what if we created something that existed across all of our magazines at the company to recognize women who are leading change in industry. And that's how our program, Influential Women in Manufacturing, started. It was three of us, all women, who started this kind of grassroots initiative because, frankly, we saw a need for it. We we decided we'd have a nomination process, um, soliciting nominations from throughout industry, you know, having people nominate their colleagues, their mentors, their supervisors, or, or women they've mentored. And a team of editors at our magazines would review the nominations and then select about two dozen women who would be recognized um, as that year's class of influential women in manufacturing honorees. And I got to say, the response that we got from industry was phenomenal. You know, women were so grateful for the chance to tell their stories and talk about their hopes for the next generation of women in manufacturing, you know, and for, and for your daughter's generation as well. And to you know, offer their perspectives for other companies on what works and what doesn't when it comes to advancing women in industry. Um, and as well as, you know, men and women in organizations saying, hey, you know, thanks for the chance to kind of give props to people on our team who sometimes don't get the spotlight. So, you know, influential women in manufacturing has honored women in maintenance and reliability roles, in in engineering roles, and educators, you know, as well as women in the C-suite. So it's something that was kind of a personal mission for us, and then it it grew into something that was really, we were fortunate um, to find celebrated throughout industry. That's really cool. Now, when did that all come together, and when did that start? 
Yeah, so it was late 17, 2017 when we launched um, the program. And then our kind of first year, our first class of influential women in manufacturing RE's was in 2018. Um, and then the program, we had we had 100 nominations the first year, which was phenomenal. And then the second year, you know, we grew and we had, I think, 125 um, and we honored, I think, 27 women then last year. And, and the, yeah, the program's continuing. We had, we had a chance to honor women at um, a breakfast at a, at a conference that one of our publications was having um, the first year of the program. And then last fall, we actually had a chance to have our own event, a, um, a luncheon honoring all of that year's honorees. And it was, you know, these, these great stories that come out of these kinds of things. Our, our first year when we had that breakfast honoring the first class of, of IWIM honorees, we had a woman from um, who was in maintenance and reliability out at a company in Idaho. She brought her mom and her daughter with her to see her accept the award because that's how much it meant to her. And it's one of these, you know, moments where you're like, wow, this has an impact, you know, and we want to be able to continue to share these stories with, with women in the industry and again for the next generation as well. No doubt. That is amazing. I mean, it's so great to hear, you know, that you had that type of support and, and interest and um, just just by hearing the number of candidates that were submitted, it tells you you definitely yeah. hit you hit something that, that was uh, people recognize of value and importance. So hats off. That's great. That's what a great story. And, and, and I can only imagine the feeling that the, the example you gave for, for her mom and her daughter to see her win that yeah. award, uh, just the sense of pride and, and, you know, just of, of accomplishment. And so, uh, that's wonderful. I mean, and that's why you design those types of programs. Mm -hmm. So great, right, yeah. great story. I mean, so if you're an employer, cool. employer out there right now, you know, and you're mm -hmm. recruiting, you're trying to build your workforce and, 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 you know, get the next line set up for, for the people coming in, what should you consider, mm -hmm. Uh, in those efforts to increase diversity in the workforce? I think one of the positive developments is that this is increasingly on people's radar. You know, the number of programs um, and organizations talking about gender inclusion, gender equity as a goal for their organization in the next 10 years, that's really grown in the past decade, which is great progress. Where a lot of organizations are right now is, okay, you know, we recognize a need we want to make a commitment. Now what? Where, you know, where do we go from here? And I think one of the key things in kind of working to realize your goals is taking a step back and saying, okay, we can't do things the way we've always done that. You know, throughout the manufacturing industry, that's one of the things that holds organizations back, whether it's, you know, adopting new technologies, changing processes, evolving organizational culture, or getting the people on your team who maybe haven't been there and haven't had their voices represented in the past. It's, well, that's how we've always done things, right? That holds the organizations back. So from a recruiting perspective, you've got to look at where are you going to recruit talent? This is such a, a crucial issue. More than half of college students right now in the U.S. are women. 56% um, of college students, I think it was last fall, were women. You've got incredible talent pool out there. If they're not coming to your organization, how can you change what you are doing to better reach them? And it's a multifaceted thing, but I think we got to look at, so where are you, really where are you going in terms of recruiting events or, you know, or job boards? If you go to the same job fairs that you're always going to, you know, virtual or in person right now, um, you might be getting the same candidates. It's this idea of if you do the exact same thing, the exact same way with the exact same people, you're probably going to get the same results. Look at who's on your recruiting team. Who are you sending out to job fairs? Honestly, if you are sending, if you're sending out a team to a job fair, whether it's, you know, high school, college, whatever, and it's all three white guys over 50, if I'm a student who is not in that category, do I see myself reflected in your company? Do I see a place for myself in your company? Um, so you need to be sending out a diverse team to connect with people, to talk about their stories of how 
you know, they entered the organization and how they feel that their voice is heard at the organization. You got to think too about expanding um, the base of, of where you're going and the organizations that you're connecting with. Are you connecting with community colleges in your area that honestly might already have programs supporting women or, you know, adult, other adult learners advancing careers in industry? Have you connected with National Society of Black Engineers, which was founded in 1975 at Purdue? Have you connected with Society of Women Engineers, which is a huge organization with incredible resources, not just for women engineers, obviously, but for organizations looking to expand gender diversity there? So, you know, if you want to get different results, you've got to broaden your thinking a little bit and not just go to those same old job boards, same job fairs same events, the same recruiting avenues that you've always pursued. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you basically just define the definition of insanity, right? I mean, that that's it. Just right. doing the same yeah. thing, expecting different results. And, you know, there they were some great examples you just provided, Christine, for our listeners to, to really invest their time in and, and hopefully, you know, make some change. And if you want to take a leadership role from an employee, um, mm-hmm. from an employer standpoint in this space of gender equity and diversity, what does that look like? Sure. One of the key things is making your, you know, making your people um, visible, making sure that their voices are heard. So we talk about, you know, diversity is having a seat at the table. Um, equity is being able to, you know, speak up and ha- and share your voice. Um, inclusion is really being heard. You know, having having a sense of. Um, true belonging and and mutual respect there. So organizations that are taking a lead on this, um, they walk the walk and kind of and put them their money where their mouth is. Um, it's the type of investment that has to come from the top. There has to be buy-in, you know, at all levels. So you need to take leadership on this from the executive level. This can't be seen as something that is just an HR initiative. And it can't be something that is just a women's thing. This is something where you're talking about improving, really improving your your pipeline of talent and getting your organization ready to meet the demands of what's coming up ahead. You know, we talk about changes in the manufacturing industry in terms of increased automation, in terms of evolving skill sets that are going to be needed to um, to compete, you know, globally, um, you're going to need a diverse group of talent to to step up. And how are you how are you reaching talent, um, both in you know in education and in the community? And then how are you allowing talent to to thrive and to shine once they're in your organization? That's another key area at influential and manufacturing that we found from research is. It's one thing to get people into your organization. It's another thing to get them to stay, right? So retention of talent is a top issue for manufacturers um, right now. And one of the things that will cause people to leave is not is a culture where they don't feel supported. You know, you think you are hired on to bring a certain skill set, certain perspective, certain talent to the role. Are you really able to contribute? fully in what you're hired to do. You know, I I have a personal friend who was was brought on to lead um, Six Sigma initiatives at at her organization. And it was a culture that was really not receptive to change and really fell back on, well, that's the way we've always done things. Um, She was the first woman in the organization to hold the role. And there was a lot of resistance, you know, to her and to what she was trying to do. She was seen as an outsider and she was seen as you know, um, a woman and someone who wasn't trusted as much as some of the guys who've been on the team for, you know, for 30 years. Are you going to have people stay and be able to make the changes you hired them to make if they are not, you know, welcomed and really supported throughout all levels of the company? Right. I mean, I guess it's just build a strong level of trust with those type of employees, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, from this standpoint, Christine, I guess what what gets overlooked then, if you're looking at an employer, or, or what doesn't get the attention that it need that it should, when it comes to making these advances. Yeah, you know, I think 
there are multiple facets to that. Um, but it gets back again to it can't just be an HR thing and it can't be a woman's thing. It's about it's about everybody and advancing the organization overall. Um, you want to connect better with customers with an increasingly diverse customer base. They need to be able to see people on your team that they can relate to. They need to understand that your team, whether it's a product development team or, you know, an executive leadership team, that they are able to understand and empathize with, you know, with your needs, with your own customers' needs and concerns. Um, You've got to have a variety of perspectives on your internal teams to be able to provide that, you know, diversity of thought, diversity of experience. They're going to better inform what you're offering in in the marketplace. Um, other things that get overlooked, I think the fact that everybody has accountability here. You know, everybody has an opportunity to step up too. Um, if you're, you know, if you're a man and you see opportunity for improvement on this, it's it's great to be um, an advocate and to you know vocally support women in the company. Um, but I would say. Don't think that, you know, because you're a man or because you're um, somebody else in whatever kind of initiative you're, you're talking about who's not part of that group that we're, that we're discussing, um, that you can't have a role in changing things. You know, um, there's no reason not to be a part of a, a part of a team, a part of an initiative that's working on this just because you are not part of that specific group. If you, I'd say, if you recognize that there is a need for change, you're already ahead of the game. You are already poised to help bring about change, to be a leader. So, you know, don't don't be afraid. Like, step up and be part of the solution. Everybody has to pull together and everyone has ownership mm-hmm. in the solution, right? Right. Absolutely. Love it. And I know, Christine, we talked a little bit offline about the different types. Of, you know, you've talked about culture quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And team building activities and things like that, that kind of define the culture and help build a positive culture. What type of events could be implemented or tried out, you know, by employers? Maybe they're not thinking about these types of things to really bolster their position towards, you know, a positive culture with diversity and inclusion there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I talked about an example, um, I was looking up information last year about uh, a conference I was maybe going to attend. And, you know, the, the two networking events at this industry conference, both of them were golf outing, you know, <laughs> and you, uh, nothing wrong with, with golf outings, but you reach a point where if that's the only opportunity you're, you're offering for kind of, uh, you know, outside and off the clock networking, is that going to be as inclusive as you, as you might want it to be, you know, look at, your company and who has access to, you know, to golfing opportunities to be able to feel like they can really engage and, and be part of this company initiative. So it's not something you got to throw out your playbook entirely and, you know, scrap everything that you've done and curious, you know, company traditions, just looking at, well, how can we maybe add something um, or do different things that might really welcome everybody that don't, require a certain background or skill set or, you know, interest in a, in a particular hobby. Things like volunteer events, you know, those are really inclusive. Obviously we're, we're dealing with change times right now. What's, what's available. Um, not to say that there aren't online opportunities as well. So looking at like a team outing to um, pack food at a local food pantry. Um, those are super popular and really successful events. It's something everybody can rally behind. And again, you don't need a specific skill set or experience level. Participating in a charity, you know, run, walk, roll, that's something that even can be done virtually now. And you get, you can still get people signed up if you can't bring people together, you know, on a, on a weekend. Um, you can still allow everybody to take part and be part of something, that's, you know, bigger than themselves and provide a talking point, a connection point. Um, those are really cool opportunities. You know, if you look at things like a weeknight outing to a ball game, I mean, I love that kind of thing, right? I, I would love the chance to go to, to go to a Cubs game or something on a weeknight. But, you know, for, for the single parents on your team, are they going to be able to take part in that kind of networking opportunity? Are they going to have a chance to talk to people, connect with people, maybe hire up 
share some ideas, share some stories, get to know people better, make those kind of connections that can be really meaningful for your career if you're worried about, you know, cobbling together childcare, that kind of thing. So it's just taking, again, taking a step back and thinking, well, how could we maybe add something or do something a little bit differently to make sure we're allowing opportunity for everybody to participate? I love it. I think those are all great ideas and areas i mean I, i'm with you on the ball game part but i hadn't thought about you know sometimes there are constraints where people can't always make that you know so being yeah. able to to think outside the box you know the volunteer portion you mentioned that's great team building period you know and, and if it's particularly mm-hmm. if it's around right. a, a cause that maybe the company yeah has some alignment in and can support and people can really get behind it. these are all great ideas christine yeah when you know when everybody can take ownership over something whether it's an actual work initiative or, or a volunteer project. I mean, that just builds the kind of buy-in that really, you know, you can yield dividends in terms of retention and engagement. It's just, it it really is like a a win-win. So they were all kind of things outside of the work environment from a team building standpoint. What about inside the work environment? Any, any advice you would give employers there that are trying to improve that culture? Yeah. Um, so one of the, uh, several of the women actually that we have honored through influential women in manufacturing have talked about the value of employee resource groups, um, which people have different experiences with them. And certainly they take real commitment and kind of organized um, thought behind to be successful, but offering people the chance to connect um, with individuals throughout the organization based on, you know, a particular function or, or background or, or area of study. Um, so one resource group that we um, heard about at, for example, um, large industrial automation company, um, they had a group for uh, women engineers, and it was a smaller kind of subgroup of Society of Women Engineers. It was kind of, kind of like this company's own Society of Women Engineers chapter. And because this is such a large company, there are women in engineering roles located, you know, across the country and in different functions, even within the headquarters office, um, you know, working in different capacities. And it was a chance for them to come together even just once a month and do lunch and learn sessions, talk about, you know, projects they're working on, um, different opportunities or challenges they've encountered, offering a space to connect and, um, you know, meet up with somebody you know, virtually or in person who has a similar role or who is engaged in a different part of the company, you make those connections that can be really valuable for having somebody who's got your back when it comes time to, you know, promotions or or moving around within the company. Um, So employee resource groups are really valuable. Again, even the basic kind of company-wide discussion sessions, ones that are focused on diversity and inclusion, why it matters, um, things that the company is is trying to do, offering people on your team who don't necessarily always have the chance to have the spotlight, um, talk about what they're doing. You know, if you've got a maintenance and reliability leader um, who is engaged in some really powerful work that's moving the needle for the company, offering them a chance to talk firsthand about what they're doing, not just having reports come down, you know, from HR or from the communications team, um, giving people a chance to have their voice, you know, be amplified. It can be something that shows a sign of respect for all teams within the organization. Um, and, you know, again, allow people to see themselves um, reflected in, you know, in different roles throughout the company. Right. Absolutely. I mean, and, se- and, and several of these instances that, you, that you've brought up here, I'm thinking about, I mean, it's it's helping you, one, network, but two, people to understand mm-hmm. how the value you bring and, and to, to just help you navigate yeah. throughout your career. So for the, the listener out there right now that, Christine, maybe they're, they're trying to figure out how to navigate that and they're trying to understand how to, what's the best way to network or how do I establish a mentorship with someone Mm-hmm. What what advice would you give that listener? Yeah, you know, sometimes taking the first step can be the hardest, right? We're all busy. We've all got so many things to do. And it's easy to let big ideas kind of fall by the wayside when you're trying to put out the fires day to day, right? Um, but just take the first step. You know, you don't you don't have to have this grand 
plan um, totally ready to go before you you start moving. Don't uh, we talk about sometimes in the industry, you know, paralysis by analysis. Well, this is don't be paralyzed by fear of it's just overwhelming. Take that first step. Reach out to somebody. Reach out to you know if it's someone in HR, if it is a woman at a high level of your organization. Reach out to the CTO or the CFO or you know whomever who's in who's in a position that you could maybe see yourself moving into, or you'd like to find out that path. People love to talk about their, their own stories, right? If there's somebody you're intrigued about, you know, his or her story, reach out to them. I mean, there's no, there's no harm in putting that question out there of, Hey, can we connect sometime, you know, over, over coffee or something? Can we do, can we do a zoom call, you know, at the beginning or the end of the work, your work day sometime? Um, I just love to hear a little bit more about, your background and, you know, why you, why you love what you do, why you, you know, why you do with company. People most of the time, I think will be flattered by that interest. And um, if you can talk even with other people in other functions, you know, at your organization, um, if you've got an idea for something, it starts with one person, right? It starts with one, one idea for, well, Hey, maybe we could, maybe we could try to, you get a few people together you bring up an idea to, you know, to supervisor, to management, you don't know where it can go or what, what can flourish. So, um, again, it's that, you know, initial outreach. If you're seeing, hey, it'd be great to get together virtually with some other, with some other parents. If you want to do a parent resource group, if you want to talk with other women who are in engineering roles in your organization, um, put the question out there. Find out what kind of, you know, interest there is and, just keep at it, man. It's those, it's those first steps. I think you just got to be bold, right? You, you can't be mm-hmm. afraid to take the initiative, like you said, and put yourself out there. Great advice. Great mm-hmm. advice. Thank you for that. So if you look at this topic, Christine, you know, whose responsibility is it? You know, where does the accountability lie? Sure. Well, it's, it's going to sound kind of cliche, but again, it's, it's everybody's responsibility, right? Everybody has to take ownership of the organization's culture because everybody is a part of it. You know, everybody is affecting the organization's culture. Um, you can have really great buy-in if you've got one or two people on the team who are who are toxic, that can have a really outsized effect on um, on the overall organization. So um, it's everybody's responsibility. Ultimately accountability's gotta be um, it's got to be at the top. The people who are leading initiatives. If you're gonna, if you're gonna really enable success with, you know, gender equity or racial equity, any initiative that you're looking to target, you got to put some numbers behind it, right? Again, we talk in in manufacturing industrial production about you can't manage what you don't measure. So, put some targets behind it. Put some numbers behind it, and then make those yearly progress reports. 2020 has thrown everybody, you know, the biggest curveball they could never have imagined. But that doesn't mean that initiatives like these have to fall by the wayside because you know what? The same challenges are going to be there in 2021 and 2022. You have a manufacturing industrial production workforce that needs change. It needs people. It needs talent, number one, to fill these changing, evolving roles. Um, And it's going to need diversity of thought on leadership teams, on product teams, on maintenance and reliability teams to, again, meet the needs of the organization and the marketplace going forward. So you got to look at, do you have women who are leaving your workforce right now because they have caregiving responsibilities and they can't make that work and there's no flexibility on the organization's end to allow them to be successful in their role and also meet the needs of their family. If you have women who are leaving your organization now, how are you going to make that back up in 2021 and 2022 and going on? So it's not something that can be put on the back burner again, just because you're trying to put out all these fires of today. Right. Um, you have to, you got to take a, a forward thinking approach and look at, I mean, there was that study out, you know, women in the manufacturing industry from from Deloitte a couple of years ago. Women are about half the U.S. workforce, only about 30% of the U.S. manufacturing workforce. Again, as we talked about earlier, women make up more than half of the college student population in the U.S. right now. You have an incredible pool 
of available talent, studying and working to build the skills that, you know, the industrial community is going to need. How are you going to reach them? How are you going to bridge that gap? Um, there could be, Deloitte estimated a couple of years ago, a workforce um, shortage, a workforce gap of 2.5 million workers in this country by 2025. There is an incredible opportunity if you put some thought and effort behind it of how are we going to engage, how are we going to do things a little bit differently, and you know, reach the diverse group of talent that we are going to need to be best positioned to succeed in the future. And Christine, I'm hoping that with conversations like this on relevant topics like this, uh, we'll get the get the attention and and start creating more dialogue and opportunities for uh, change and discussion about it. I love how you put the metrics behind it. You know, you're right. If you don't measure it, you, uh, you can't manage it. So that's great mm-hmm. advice. Great, great uh, insight, wisdom there. Um, and you have really unpacked just a tremendous amount of, in- of insight and knowledge for our listeners today. And we always like to wrap up Eco Ask Why with the why, where we get down to the purpose and so, Christine, I guess my question to you would be, you know, why it matters for companies to remain focused on building diverse talent pipelines? Yeah, it gets back to what's the workforce that you're going to need to succeed in 2025 and 2030? Do you want to be, you know, out there um, at the forefront? It's not enough to just hang on. It wasn't enough in 2019, and it's not going to be enough coming out of, you know, a global pandemic and a global economic crisis. If you want to, if you, you know, you've got vision and you have um, ideas of, you know, momentum where you want your company to go, you're going to need the team that's going to help get you there. That's going to need to be a team that has, that brings to the table a diversity of thought, a diversity of backgrounds and experiences that are offering things that you might not have thought out, things that might not have been brought up if you have you know, a board where everybody looks the same or came from the same schools or came from the same economic background or racial and ethnic background. You need people bringing up things um, that your customers are going to be looking for. That's why you need to go out and recruit the talent who's going to bring those fresh perspectives, diversity of ideas to the table. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I mean, great summary, Christine. Thank you again great way to end this series a powerful uh, discussion here a lot of insight a lot of wisdom and and I, i really appreciate you taking your time with us today thanks so much chris it's been such a pleasure it's been a phenomenal series that you are doing so thank you so much for this thank you for listening to eco ask why this show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.